Hello and welcome to Rando Tech Info and part three of our hands-on history of Android series. And today we're going to be looking at the original Galaxy S and its place in Samsung, Android, and smartphone history. While this is the first of the Galaxy S phones, there were actually two other Galaxy phones released before the original S. The original Galaxy phone, which was just called the Samsung Galaxy, and the Galaxy Spica. I think I'm saying that right. However, when looking at the origins of the Galaxy series, I thought looking at the original S was the proper starting point. The original Galaxy and the Spica looked like a lot of other Android phones of the day, with their 3.2 inch screens and their bevy of physical buttons sitting below them. But the original S marked a new direction for Samsung. With its big screen and minimalist style, it was the direct predecessor to the Galaxy S series you know and love today. Well, I assume you love them or you probably wouldn't be watching this video. Good point. The S1 went on sale in June of 2010, over three years after the original iPhone, and almost two years after the original Android phone, the T-Mobile G1, and in its first three years of release, Samsung sold over 25 million S1 units. A big reason for the S1 success was up until this point in 2010, most Android phones had three or three and a half inch screens, and most still had multiple physical buttons on the front of the phone. Heck, a lot of those phones still had full physical QWERTY keyboards, but the S1 was different. Its large screen and single front-facing mechanical home button much more closely resembled the form factor of the iPhone. As a result, using the S1 in 2021 feels a lot like using a smartphone in 2021. The screen was small by today's standards, but the 4-inch screen on the S1 was considered mammoth at the time. It was almost an inch bigger than the Galaxy phone screens that came before it, and it was a full half inch bigger than the 3.5 inch screen on the iPhone 4 that, by the way, was released the same month as the S1. This was the device where we saw Samsung really start to prioritize its screens, something Samsung still prioritizes to this day. And it wasn't just the size of the screen either. It was an AMOLED screen with 480 by 800 resolution and featured Gorilla Glass protection. Other specs of the phone were equally top notch. The 45 nanometer Hummingbird processor along with the 512 megabytes of RAM helped the phone feel peppy and responsive even now. Depending on the variant of the phone you had, you either had 8 or 16 gigabytes of onboard storage. But even if you only had the 8 gigabyte variant, the expandable storage provided via the micro SD card slot made sure you had plenty of space, a feature the current S series of phones no longer provides. Speaking of discontinued features, the S1 also had a very useful headphone jack, and in my opinion, an even more useful and eco-friendly removable battery. Your standard Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and GPS options were also all available on the S1, along with a micro USB charging port, which was the standard of the day. The phone was very light and pocketable despite the large screen, one of the benefits of ditching the physical keyboard. The downside of this, of course, was the lack of a physical keyboard. However, if you turn the 4-inch screen sideways, texting isn't too big of a pain. And yes, I was able to text and make phone calls on this thing when my T-Mobile SIM card was inside it. Pretty amazing considering the phone is over 11 years old, and I would even say the call quality was pretty good. Hey, you're on Rando Tech Info. Say something cool. Liquid nitrogen. As mentioned earlier, the form factor on the S1 really helped Samsung bring its phones into the modern era. Without the physical keyboard, the only physical buttons on this phone were the home button, the power button, and the volume rocker. There was also a menu and a back button on the front of the phone, but those were touch buttons built into the display panel. As for cameras, the S1 actually had two. The rear camera was a 5 megapixel shooter with autofocus and could film in 720p at 30 frames per second. That's high definition, people. You have to remember this phone is from 2010. I mean, seriously, photos from this phone really don't look that bad, at least when the lighting is good. In the video, while it pales to the video on something like the S21 Ultra, which is the phone I usually use to film these videos, is actually usable. If not for content creation, then at least for something that can capture some memories. The camera also had some other features that were pretty cutting edge for the time. It had digital zoom, multiple focus modes, the option to turn on guidelines and change resolution, various picture effects, different shutter sounds, and you could choose to brighten the screen for better outdoor visibility. Heck, the camera even had a primitive stabilization mode referred to in the menu as anti-shake. But the features don't end there. You could actually fine tune your photos by adjusting the exposure, white balance, ISO, contrast, saturation, and sharpness. Seriously, that's a lot of phone options for a phone camera in 2010. And it was a foreshadowing of the pro modes you can find on the S series today. The front facing camera was just a 0.3 megapixel snapper, but hey, in 2010, it was still a big deal for a phone to even have a front facing camera. 
Out of the box, the S1 was running Android 2.1, otherwise known as Eclair, with Samsung's TouchWiz 3.0 skin running over the top. Some TouchWiz special features included the ability to add, delete, and rearrange your home screens and customize your shortcuts. Other standard Android Eclair features included the ability to set live wallpapers, some pretty cool ones actually, use thumbnail navigation on the home screens, an updated looking app launcher, new widgets, and improved voice to text capabilities. The phone also had some pretty rock and ring tones. The phone will be updated in most regions in early 2011 to Android 2.2 Froyo, and some variants of the phone would receive the Android 2.3 Gingerbread update later that same year. There are actually several variants of this phone and the variant you had was usually based on the region you bought the phone in as well as the carrier you bought the phone from, although with the exception of the name of the phone and when the phone received updates, the overall experience between them, for the most part, was pretty similar. Sadly, as the S1 is over 11 years old and a 3G device, my access to different apps on the phone was limited. I couldn't access the Play Store, so I couldn't download any new apps and a lot of the phone's preloaded apps such as Gmail and YouTube, and the internet browser also no longer function. However, as I mentioned earlier, I could make calls and texts. I could also use the voice recorder, the calculator, listen to stored music, and even listen to FM radio, which I found to actually be pretty cool. Almost equally cool was Google Maps still worked. I say almost equally because I did kind of expect Google Maps to work, since it also still worked on my even older G1, and Droid One smartphones. By the way, the hands-on history of Android series started with the G1 and the original Droids, so if you are interested in hearing more about those phones, I will leave links down in the description, and if you want to catch future retro Android tech videos, you might want to sub to the channel. Great idea! So what are my final thoughts about the original Samsung Galaxy S? Well, in the first two History of Android episodes, I was struck by just how different those phones felt to our modern day phones. This time around, I was struck by just how much this phone did feel like a modern day phone. I could call and text, the screen was big enough and sharp enough I didn't struggle to use it, apps opened quickly, touch response time was relatively lag free, and the camera could actually take some decent photos in good light. If I wouldn't have been able to download a couple of apps in the Play Store and check my email, I think I could have actually used this as my daily use device for a few days. When looking at the S1's place in history, I think it will be remembered as a turning point not just for Samsung, but for Android phones in general. Moving forward from 2010, other Android phones would continue to move away from physical keys and keyboards and towards the more simple glass slab design that the vast majority of smartphones still use today. And while you can certainly argue that the S1 stole its design language from the iPhone, Apple stole right back the next year, dropping a 4-inch screen into the iPhone 5. And it was at this point, I think you could say, that the smartphone screen wars had begun. Well, that's all the information I have today about the original Galaxy S. Did you own the original Galaxy S or another early Galaxy smartphone? If you did, please feel free to share your feelings and your memories down in the comments. As always, I hope you found this video useful. Thanks for watching. And until next time, this is Rando Tech Info, signing out.